Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Speaking of Resilience podcast. I'm today's host, Jamie Simmons, with the Michigan Climate Action Network, or MICAN. This podcast is also brought to you by the Groundwork Center. Today is the last special episode from the Michigan Climate and Clean Energy Summit, and we ended with inspiring marks by Nana Agarwal Harding, a national leader within the Sunrise Movement and the U.S. Climate Strike Coalition, who just graduated from high school in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In this episode, Nana weaves together her life story and her experiences from being this in the center of youth climate movement and is truly inspiring and you don't want to miss it. We're so excited to have you with us, Nana. Hi everyone. It is so wonderful to be here with you all today and thank you for that lovely introduction, Jamie. Um, and I'd like to start off by telling you all a little bit about the places I'm from. Um, rural Appalachia, Northern India, and of course, Michigan. Because although my family's roots span multiple continents, my places of origin are more connected than you might think. My maternal grandparents live in a remote valley in East Tennessee, nestled right at the entry to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park on occupied Cherokee territories. And it's a place of immense beauty, but also immense poverty. There's no cell service and most folks live in poorly insulated shacks. Um, when the Gatlinburg fire hit the region uh, back in 2016, and I'll share with you a few images of, of that fire as I speak, um, it was devastating. It tore through the beautiful forests that I have grown up day hiking in because a drought that fall had left the wood extremely dry. And my grandparents' home with its 1950s wood paneling and its overstuffed bookshelves, where I've spent every Christmas and Easter growing up, um, was only spared by a last minute shift in the winds. Um, in the aftermath with an eroded social safety net, it took months for residents to regain stability. And to be honest, four years later, folks are still recovering. So to know Happy Valley is to know that poverty and climate change are twin crises. But they aren't the only crises that the Valley faces. Many of our neighbors there fly Confederate flags. Most of them own multiple guns. Um, and on good days, you know, I look at the Happy Valley Community Center, which is lovingly maintained by a few residents. And I think that maybe this community could come together and model resiliency in the face of disaster. But on worse days, I really worry that as climate change intensifies, the community might cope with scarce resources and, and scary circumstances by turning to violence. Um, my paternal grandparents live in a small village called Borbasgunj, and that's in the Indian state of Bihar. My dad's family has uh, called Forbes Gunch home since before he was born, and seasonal floods have been getting worse since I was a little kid. In recent years, I have watched in horror as my phone lights up each year with, with photos of dogs struggling to keep their heads above water or fruit vendors' carts toppled upside down and floating through the floodwaters. And every time this happens, I feel this strange guilt in the pit of my stomach because our neighbors suffer and my family is spared just because we lucked into a home on higher ground. Our house there is on a hill. And like Happy Valley, Forbes Gunj is chronically poor. Um, it has suffered from decades of disinvestment, which have led to polluted air, a lack of quality education, and inadequate healthcare infrastructure. And it has its own social conflicts too. I'm not allowed to leave the house by myself there because of the risk of violence against women. Um, and this is one of the ever fewer parts of India where Hindu and Muslim residents have historically coexisted without conflict, but religious tension does simmer under the surface. And so here also the instability caused by the climate crisis could inspire cross-sectarian mutual aid, but it could also catalyze violence and, and perpetuate oppression. And, you know, I needn't explain to you all how the climate crisis shows up in Michigan. From the Flint water crisis to the Marathon oil refinery in Detroit to the effort to decommission Line 5, we know our state is ground zero for fighting environmental injustice. I remember <laughs> as a fifth grader in Ann Arbor Public Schools feeling this immense 
rage and confusion after learning that the same state leaders who refused to spend money to stop poisoning little kids in Flint were also cutting my favorite teachers' salaries and making them pay for Crayola markers and safety scissors for our classrooms out of pocket. And that anger and confusion about why we prioritize the things we do never really went away as I got older. But as I've grown, I think my understanding of the climate crisis has been really shaped by the challenges faced by each place I call home. And I've come to see that the climate crisis isn't just about parts per million of CO2 or the percentage by which we cut our emissions. And rather it's about interconnected injustices, poverty and white supremacy, and gun violence and gender violence, religious conflict, environmental racism, they're all issues that reinforce each other, and the climate crisis threatens to worsen all of them. For a really long time, I felt crushed by the enormity of this very difficult truth about my generation's future, and admittedly, it's, it, it's pretty bleak. Um, and none of the so-called solutions that I was hearing about, like recycling more, walking to school, eating less meat, seemed to come even close to addressing the heart of the issue because none of them promised to keep communities that are already suffering from bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. None of them aimed to, to bridge the divides along lines of class and race and religion and gender that kept my communities from healing in the wake of disaster. Which is how, in August of 2019, I found myself at a YMCA camp in Boone, Iowa, with 50 other young climate activists. And we had assembled from all corners of the country to plan for the September 20th climate strikes. And we were tasked with crafting a set of nationwide demands for the strikes. Among us were kids from California, Columbus, Ohio, Connecticut, and everywhere in between. There were Black organizers and Indigenous leaders, and biracial kids like me. There were Fridays for Future strikers and Sunrise Movement members and Black Lives Matter leaders. And to be honest, things were tense at the start. <laughs> we formed little cliques based on the regions and identities and organizations that we belonged to. And you know, coalition building is hard on its own. So with a group of sleep deprived teenagers, it had really sort of begun to feel impossible. Um, on the third day of the retreat, we gathered in the basement of the camp lodge and we had 24 hours to emerge with a demand set that would resonate with organizers like us all over America. And Welch's fruit snacks wrappers began to sort of pile up as we talked in circles about what percentage of our planet's biodiversity it would be reasonable to ask to be protected, and whether it was more important to fight for climate refugee safety or indigenous people's sovereignty. We were seated in folding chairs under fluorescent lights, and it was just as depressing as it sounds. So we took a 15 minute break. And when we got back, one of the adult organizers who was helping to facilitate our retreat told us a story about her experience organizing mutual aid in the wake of Hurricane Irma, which, as you may recall, hit Florida and the Caribbean back in 2017. And when she had finished, you could have heard a pin drop in the room. She told us to turn to our neighbor and talk about why we were really there and explain our stake in the fight. So I turned to my neighbor, and she was a Colombian Ashkenazi Jew. And I told her about the Gatlinburg fire and about the persistent flooding in Forbes Gunj and um, about the injustice in Flint. And she told me that where she was from in the Pacific Northwest, the orca whales and the salmon were dying out and that she had had her own experience with fire. Her city had been covered in a thick layer of smog when Southern Canada caught flame. And as we all talked, I could feel the energy in the room shifting. Um, when folks had finished talking, a Muslim girl from Baltimore got up and um, she walked over to, to the room, um, the, the wall of the room, where there was a, a whiteboard hanging on the wall. And, you know, I'll see if I can share with you all a picture of what she drew. Um, so she proposed, what if we just had one demand that connected to all the other pieces that we have been trying to fit together. She, she drew this flower and she gestured to the center and she added, maybe we could use the Green New Deal framework. 
um, an undocumented girl from California got up and suggested we could put the Green New Deal in the middle and then we could put biodiversity protection and sustainable agriculture and, and all these other things we've been discussing all night into the petals. They could each have their own. And I could see people sort of starting to perk up in, in the room. So some more of us added petal suggestions, like we could add land back for indigenous peoples. We could add addressing environmental racism. Uh, we could add humane climate migration policies. And the idea that we didn't have to choose which of our struggles was most worthy of uplifting was absolutely exhilarating. I felt this frenetic, triumphant energy building in the room as more and more people got up to add to our flower. And my heart beat faster and faster and suddenly we were all on our feet and someone had written Generation Green New Deal on the board and before I knew it, everyone in the room was hugging and jumping up and down and chanting Gen G and D, Gen G and D. And anything in the world felt possible. Um, my future, which I had viewed, I guess for longer than I had realized as sort of dark and folded in on itself, just expanded into light and, and openness. And it was a moment unlike, I think, anything else I'll experience in my lifetime. Um, so the next day we, we packed our bags and we headed back to our hometowns for the final push. We gave announcements in our high school classrooms to recruit strike participants. We secured excused absences for peers who wanted to walk out on September 20th. We printed Gen GND flyers and created artful sidewalk chalk installations, many of which featured that flower from Iowa, um, to advertise the upcoming protest. And it was a smashing success. On September 20th, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets in the US alone to demand climate justice. I'm still in touch with the folks I met in Iowa, and they're doing incredible things. We have since worked together on other projects like a massive Earth Day 2020 live stream event. And I wouldn't say coalition building has gotten any easier, but we have certainly gotten better at it. And the moral of this story isn't that one solution, even an intersectional one like the Green New Deal is gonna save us from the climate crisis, right? Nor is it that young people know something that our elders don't because after all in Iowa, older organizers were the ones who knew how to end our stagnation by helping us connect with each other. So rather than, rather, rather than one solution or one generation, what happened in Iowa and I think everything the youth movement has accomplished since then serves as evidence that our best shot at winning against the climate crisis is to allow the things which have historically divided us to unite us now as we grapple with the challenge of our lifetimes. We don't all face the same struggles, nor do we all bear equal responsibility for the crisis we're in. But just as the different places that I'm from have complemented each other in shaping my view of the climate crisis, I think the things that make us different from each other as people where we grew up and our race, our age, our class, our gender, our sexual orientation, our religion can actually help us come together as we fight for a better future. So that's what brings me hope. The idea that the differences which have been weaknesses can be turned into strengths and that they can draw us closer together instead of pushing us further apart. I want to be clear that to make that happen is no easy feat. For us, it required days of conflict amidst cornfields and really skilled facilitation and a willingness to be vulnerable with people we didn't know or trust yet. Um, but, but this is a huge part of why I agreed to speak with you all today is that it makes me so hopeful to see labor leaders and environmental justice campaigners and local and federal politicians and young activists come together around a just transition towards something better and brighter than what we have now and really commit to doing that work. So I thank you all for letting me share this story with you. And I really look forward to joining you in the work ahead. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nana. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for delivering that beautiful message that definitely hit home for me. And I know it hit home for a lot of people who are attending and listening to your words right now. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Speaking of Resilience podcast. You can find more episodes of the Speaking of Resilience podcast at our website, groundworkcenter.org slash podcast, miclimateaction.org slash podcast, 
or on all major podcast platforms. If you appreciate this content and want more of it, stay up to date by subscribing to the podcast wherever you listen in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps other listeners find the Speaking of Resilient podcast. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Groundwork Center and at MI Climate Action. Speaking of Resilience is created by the Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities and the Michigan Climate Action Network. This episode was produced by Taylor Kramer of Cold Shower Media in collaboration with Nick Loud of the Boardman Review.